By golly, it's amazing. It sounds like something you'd hear on the radio. Presenting the transcription feature... The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. It's half past eight New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the expert. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) And now, meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. It's the Bill Harris Alice Faye Show, presented transcribed by the makers of Rexall Drug Products. And now it's time to meet the men from the ministry. Forces Radio and Television Service presents the Bob Hope Show with Les Brown and his band of renown, and yours truly, Bill Goodwin. And now here he is, Bob Hope. Greetings. I'm Kevin Lauderdale. A few weeks back, I gave you the radio drama adaptation of the film Sunset Boulevard. Now here's the Jack Benny program where the cast does their version of it. In this episode, Mary is out sick, but her rather butch-sounding sister, Babe, is visiting from Plainfield, New Jersey. Now, by the way, Mary really did have a sister, Babe, and this is her doing, doing that voice, playing herself. But the real Babe wasn't really much like the fictional version as depicted on the radio show. Um, Babe Marks, a.k.a. Babe Bloom, does a pretty good Gloria Swanson, I think. Notes, the 1950s Kefauver hearings into organized crime conducted by the U.S. Senate were going on, and at one time they centered on reputed mob boss Frank Costello. Adrian was the single-named famous Hollywood costume designer. The litany of Irish names you hear is a play on the same from the old Irish tune Dear Old Donegal, which Bing Crosby had had a hit with in 1945. And studio executive Daryl F. Zanuck really loved to play polo. From March 25th, 1951, the Jack Benny program, Sunset Boulevard. The Jack Benny program, presented by Lucky Strike. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go lucky, go lucky, strike, be happy, be happy. I used to switch from brand to brand, but now I'm true to one. For I love Lucky's better taste, that means more smoking fun. Honestly, Lucky's tastes better than any other cigarette. Make any smoking test you want, you'll see in just a minute. Each puff on Lucky Strike will prove there's more enjoyment in it. You bet, Lucky's tastes better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go Lucky, be happy, go Lucky Strike, be happy, go Lucky, go Lucky Strike today. Friends, you know there's a real difference in cigarettes. Some are almost tasteless, while others are far too strong. Now, you can't get full enjoyment out of smokes like those. That's why, for complete smoking enjoyment, switch to Lucky Strike. You'll agree, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. You see, Lucky's are a truly happy blend which gives you everything you want in a cigarette. The reason is fine tobacco. For fine tobacco and only fine tobacco always gives you perfect mildness and rich, true taste. And LSMFT... Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So for complete smoking enjoyment, make your next carton Lucky Strike. Yes, be happy. Go lucky. Because Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy. Go lucky. Go lucky. Strike today. Remember, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, since this is Easter, we bring you a man who put a small rabbit in his hat so he could have a little hair on his head... 
And here he is, Jack Bunny. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Bunny. I mean, Jack Benny talking. <laughs> and Don, that was a very clever introduction. Oh, did you like it? No, no, I didn't like it. But your joke did fit. What do you mean? What I mean is I thought it was very appropriate for you to start an Easter program by laying an egg. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, wait a minute, Jack. That was a very funny joke, and the audience thought so, too. They did not. They did, too. I'll pick anybody in the audience and prove it. Say, uh, uh, mister, mister. Oh, me? Yes, would you come up here for a minute? Don, we don't have to go through all of that. Jim. Oh, yes, we do. My future's at stake. You don't have to worry. You saved your money. Uh. <laughs> Don, believe me, it isn't that. Hey, did you want me, mister? Yes, yes. I, I, I want to ask you something, and I want your unbiased opinion. What did you think of that joke? What joke? <laughs> you see, Don, you see? What joke? The one I told when I introduced Jack Benny. Who's he? <laughs> Who's he? For your information, I'd like you to know Oh, that... wait a minute, Jack. I guess I was wrong in calling him up here. You bet you were wrong. Okay, mister, you can go sit down. Not so fast, bub. Where's my refrigerator? <laughs> refrigerator? Well, certainly. You call me up on a stage, you ask me a lot of silly questions, and I'll pay you off. <laughs> Look, mister, this isn't a quiz program. This is a comedy show. We only got you out of the audience to give us an opinion. You woke me up just for that? Now, you can go sit down. I'm not going to ask you any more questions. Okay, Senator. <laughs> go already. Uh, Jack, I'm sorry about the whole thing. That's all right, Don. Maybe I shouldn't have picked on your joke, but you see, I was so sure that since today is Easter, your introduction would have been something about my new suit, you know? Oh, forgive me, Jack. That is a beautiful suit. But what's that patch on the left shoulder? Hmm, I didn't think it would show. Patch on a new suit? Well, Don, I had to make a little alteration. You see, when it was delivered to me, my coat had three sleeves. Anyway, I think the color... But, Jack, how in the world can you get a coat with three sleeves? Well, you see, Don, this suit was made to measure, and it's my own fault for going to a tailor who was nearsighted. Oh, nearsighted? I kept telling him there was a guy standing next to me. <laughs> but he wouldn't believe me, you know? Anyway, I'm glad I got this suit. Well, Jack, on Easter, everybody dresses up. Not everybody, Don. Just look at the boys in Phil's band. <laughs> I mean, look at the way they're dressed. If they spread themselves out, they could keep the crows away from 460 acres. <laughs> You'd think they would at least show, have the little Easter spirit. Hold it, Adrian, hold it. <laughs> huh? They've got the Easter spirit. Look at Sammy, my drummer. Sammy? Hey, he does, he does look different, you know Certainly does This morning my boys got up bright and early and Went to Sammy's house and colored his head <laughs> Oh, yes, it's pink I thought he was blushing <laughs> Now turn them big blue eyes on me, Jackson And pay a little compliment I'm really dressed for Easter, ain't I? Yes, you are, Phil But why shouldn't you dress well? You can afford it, you know You do your, you know, you do my show Your own show Personal appearances, recordings. Yeah? Tell me, Phil, what is your biggest source of income? Shooting pool. <laughs> Shooting pool? When you can sink the 5, 10, and 15 ball with one shot, you're in the upper bracket. <laughs> well, how can you always be talking about pool? After all, you're a family man. I mean, what do your children think about it? They love it. What? When they say they want to see Hoppy, they mean Willie, not Cassidy. <laughs> Well, I'd like to sit down and have a long talk with you, but I don't have the time now. You see, tonight we're going to do a very important sketch. Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. As I was saying, we're going to do a very important sketch tonight about... I was in the Easter parade this morning. You were? That's nice. You'll never guess who, was, who else was there. Who? There was Brannigan, Flanagan, Milligan, Gilligan, Duffy, McCuffey, Malarkey, Mahone, now, Lafferty, Dennis, Lafferty, Lafferty Donnelly, you? Connolly, Julio, Dennis, Julie, Mahone, 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 Wait a minute. Madigan, stop Cadigan, Lan... St. Patrick's Day was last week. Dennis... Dennis, let me ask you a question. A question? Yes. Why are you so silly? I refuse to answer on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate me. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, you've been watching the investigating committee on television, huh? Yeah, I watch one fella for hours. He isn't half as funny without Abbott. <laughs> Now, Don, as I started to tell you before, as soon, as soon as Mary gets here, she may be a little late. You see, her sister Babe is visiting her from Plainfield. Anyway, as soon as Mary gets here, we're going to do a very important sketch based on a picture that's nominated for the Academy Awards. Say, that's right. This is the week of the Academy Awards. Hey, Jackson. What? You never did win anything, did you? No, Phil, not personally, but my pictures made a wonderful showing. Again, to be or not to be, the director won an award. And George Washington slept here, the cameraman got an award. What about the horn blows at midnight? The audience got the award. <laughs> well, you're wrong about that because there was no audience. <laughs> I mean, there was no audience. <laughs> and Phil, I'll make you a deal. If you forget about the horn blows at midnight, I'll forget about Wabash Avenue. And what, pray tell, was wrong with my performance in Wabash Avenue? Phil, all I know is Betty Grable and Victor Mature were in that picture with you. That's right. Well, since then, Betty Grable made two more pictures with Dan Daly. Victor Mature made three more pictures with June Haver. And Phil, what have you been doing? Shooting pool with Zanuck. <laughs> what? Two more games and the studio is mine. <laughs> Not if he shoots with a polo mallet. <laughs> now, Phil, if you'll be quiet for a moment, I'd like to tell the audience about the Academy Award picture we're going to do. Oh, say, Mr. Benny, maybe I'll win an Oscar for that picture I was in. What picture was that, Dennis? I'll Get By. Oh, yes, I'll Get By. That title was taken from a song. It was? Yes, Dennis. I'll Get By as long as I have you. You said it, kid. <laughs> oh, quiet. Now, Don... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. <laughs> Rochester, what'd you call for? Well, boss, I want you to know that when you leave for New York tonight to do your television show, you'll be going by train. By train? But, Rochester, I've been dickering all week with the airplane company. They called and said they thought your proposition over, but decided against it. Against it? Yeah, they said they don't care if you do wear your Charlie's Ant costume, they don't need an extra stewardess. <laughs> oh, well, that's too bad. And, boss, when I thought you were flying, I even saved on your luggage. How'd you do that? You know your gray suit, the one that makes you look like Clark Gable? Yes. Well, I took the padding out of the shoulders, and I put in two pairs of pajamas, ten pairs of socks, Four suits of underwear and three dozen handkerchiefs. Well, good, good. In the other shoulder, I put your shirts, ties, half <laughs> room, and two dozen sandwiches. Sandwiches? When you get hungry, just reach up your sleeve and people will think you're a magician. Never mind that. Just see that everything is packed. Now, goodbye, Rochester. I'll see you later. Oh, oh say, boss. Now what? I've got a very funny joke for your radio program. A joke? What is it, Rochester? What is it? Well... Ask Mr. Wilson if he knows why a tangerine is like a manhole cover. Oh, oh, thanks, Rochester, thanks. Goodbye. Hey, hey, Don. Oh, yes, Jack. Don, I just thought of the funniest joke. Do you know why a tangerine is like a manhole cover? No, Jack. Why is a tangerine like a manhole cover? <laughs> <laughs> because... Oh, my goodness, I forgot to ask Rochester. <laughs> How do you like that? Jack, what are you mumbling about? Nothing, nothing. Drop it. I won't drop it. Why is a tangerine like a manhole cover? Because Mr. Benny's the boss, and if you don't shut up, you're fired. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Oh, that's all right. You'll get by as long as you have me. Oh, stop! <laughs> now, Don, we have to start our sketch pretty soon, but first, we've got to have the commercial. Oh, yes, Jack, and since this is the first Sunday of spring, the... Sportsmen have prepared an appropriate number, Mendelssohn Spring Song. Mendelssohn Spring Song? Oh, that's wonderful, Don. And there's a part in it for you where you play the violin. There wasn't until rehearsal when I made you put it in, you know. Now, hand me my violin. Okay, fellas. Now, I'm, uh, I'm first in this. Mendelssohn Spring Song.
lucky strike So round, so firm and fully packed So easy on the draw For lucky strike means fine tobacco L-S-M-F-T Oh yes, you'll see A lucky strike tastes better So that's why we always say Be happy and go lucky strike Go lucky strike Wonderful, boys. Thank you very much. Now, Don, I think that we should have a... Come in. Hey, look who it is. It's Mary's sister, Bay. Hello, Jack. Well, babe, this certainly is a pleasant surprise. You know my cast, don't you? Yes, Jack. I met them a long time ago. Hi, babe. Hello, Dennis. Say, Jack, he's cute. I love tenors. Really? Yes. You know, I used to be a tenor before my voice changed. <laughs> well, now that you've mentioned your voice, babe, I wish you'd try to raise it a little. You see, it might be confusing. What do you mean, confusing? Well, people think they're hearing Tallulah on both networks. <laughs> will, you, will you raise it a little? I'll try, darling. Thanks. <laughs> Now, tell me, uh, how come you dropped in on the program, babe? Mary sent me. What? The doctor wants her to take it easy for another week or so. Oh, well, I wish I'd have known earlier. We're going to do our version of Sunset Boulevard today. And Mary was supposed to play Gloria Swanson's part. Well, Jack, why don't you let me play the Gloria Swanson role? You? <laughs> but, babe, you haven't, you know, you haven't had any acting experience. Well, Jack, I almost was an actress. You almost wasn't. Wasn't that? <laughs> oh, oh, that's all right. That's all right. You you were? Huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Huh? When I graduated from high school, I didn't know whether I should become a radio actress or a stage actress. Oh well, what did you become? A mechanic. <laughs> oh. Well, babe, uh, let me talk to Don a minute, will you? Don, Don, what do you think we ought to do? Jack, what else can we do? It's too late to change the program. I know, Don, but letting her play Gloria Swanson's part. I mean, we're taking an awful chance. They've never acted before. You know? But, Jack, we're stuck, so we'll just have to do the best we can. Oh. Well, all right, babe, you can play the part that Gloria Swanson played in the picture. We'll try it. I'll play William Holden's part, and Dennis, you'll play Eric von Stroheim's part. <laughs> Eric von Stroheim? Yes. But babe looks more like him than I do. <laughs> Never mind. But I don't want to play the part of a German butler. What? I don't want to play the part of a German butler. You'll play it, and that's all there is to it. Don, set the scene. All right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present our version of that picture, which has won several Academy Award nominations, Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> My name is Joe Gillis. Right now I have three bullets in me, and I'm floating face downwards in a swimming pool behind an old mansion on Sunset 
Boulevard. Oh, I know. You're wondering how you can hear my voice with my face underwater. I had it transcribed for release at this more convenient time. My trouble started six months ago. I was an unemployed movie writer. I had tried in vain to get a job and apply to all the studios. I went to Paramount. Then to MGM. Gillis, what can I do for you? Uh, J.S., I got a story I'd like to sell you that'll make a great picture. A story, eh? Well, give me a brief outline. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Now, the hero of my story is a psychiatrist. Oh, and... no good, my boy, no good. The psychiatry cycle's done, washed up. The trend today is pictures like uh, Broken Arrow, Tomahawk, Indian stuff. I know. You see, my hero is a half-breed psychiatrist. <laughs> Now, the girl comes to him. You and... have a girl in the story? Yes, why? Dated stuff. Movie fans want animals in pictures like... Like Lassie, Francis the Mule, Bonzo the Chimp. Oh, I know, I know. But the reason the girl is going to the psychiatrist is because her pet centipede has a complex. <laughs> ah, that's a good angle. A centipede with a complex. Yes, this centipede thinks his shoes are too tight. And the girl's going broke buying him Dr. Scholl's foot pads. <laughs> I, uh, I'm afraid that's a little too fantastic, my boy, too fantastic. As a writer, Gillis, you should realize that... Well, hello, H.W. Hiya, J.S. I dropped in to ask you if you'd like to have lunch with me and L.B. I'd like to, H.W., but I've got a lunch date with M.J. and B.G. <laughs> well, how about tonight? I'm picking up J.T. and we're going to have dinner with R.S. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm having dinner with Daryl Zanuck. Who? <laughs> DZ. Oh. Well, so long. See you later, J.S. <laughs> Goodbye, H.W. I followed H.W. out of J.S.'s office because I had a date with L.S. and M.F. to have tea. <laughs> That day, the finance company tried to repossess my car. They chased me down Sunset Boulevard, and to escape them, I turned into the driveway of an old, dilapidated mansion. The door was open, so I walked in. When my eyes became accustomed to the gloom, I realized the house wasn't deserted. Then suddenly, I saw her. <laughs> she was majestically descending a long spiral staircase. She must have come down that staircase often because her legs were spiral, too. <laughs> then she stopped and spoke. What do you want here? <laughs> I pulled into your driveway. I thought this was an empty house. Well, it's not, so get out. All right, I'll... Wait a minute. I know your face. You're Norma Desmond. You used to be in pictures. You used to be big. I'm still big. It's the pictures that got small. She was right. Her television set only had a seven-inch screen. But I turned to her and said, Miss Desmond, I've always been a fan of yours. I went to all your movies. And you were a great actress on the stage, too. Yes, there was one role I played hundreds of times. I'll never forget my favorite speech. I always felt a thrill as I said it. How did it go? If I were king... Yes, if I were king. But that's a man's part. Now he tells me. <laughs> Look, Miss Desmond, since you've retired from pictures, how do you get money? Oh, I own some stock, some income property, several apartment houses, and I have oil wells up at Bakersfield that are pumping, pump, 
pumping, pumping. Gee, stock, property, apartment houses, and oil wells that are pumping, pumping. <laughs> What's your largest source of income? Shooting pool. <laughs> when I told her I was a writer, she asked me to stay and help her with a screenplay she was preparing for her comeback. For weeks, Norma and I worked hard writing her screenplay, and gradually she began to care for me. I soon realized that she was really in love with me. Sometimes she would hold my hand. Sometimes she would pat my cheek. And one night, as she was running her fingers through my hair, I walked into the room. <laughs> I turned to her and said, Norma, this is a beautiful night. Let's go out for a ride. We can't use the car tonight. Why not? It's at the service station. It's up on the grass reek. <laughs> You too, it must run in the family. <laughs> Look, Norma, I'm hungry. Let's go out and get something to eat. We don't have to go out. I'll have my butler prepare something for you. Oh, Max. Yeah, mein Fräulein, what is los mit you? <laughs> Max, I'm hungry. What can you make for me? Gedampfte Brust, Sauerbraten, Wiener Schnitzel, Hassen Pfeffer, and Kuschlein mit Sibylis. <laughs> What's Kuschlein mit Sibylis? I don't know. I told you I didn't want to play this part. <laughs> Never mind that. Just bring me a ham sandwich. Yeah, mine hair. <laughs> Joe, dear, you have your sandwich. I'm going to change into something more comfortable. As I waited for my sandwich, I took something out of the fruit bowl. When I bit into it, I broke my two front teeth. <laughs> it was then I realized how important it was to know the difference between a tangerine and a manhole cover. <laughs> I began to tire of the whole situation. I decided to leave. And as I was packing my things to go, Max suddenly interrupted me. You are leaving here, mine hair? No, I'm taking it with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Max, I'm leaving. I can't stand it any longer. This is a weird household. Norma is so possessive. And you keep watching me. Always watching. Oh, but I got a right to watch because even though I am now her butler, once I was her 17th husband. You were her 17th husband? Who were the others? There was Brannigan, Flanagan, Milligan, Gilligan, Duffy, McCuffy, Malarkey, Mahone, Now Rappen, cut that out! <laughs> and stand aside! Mein Herr, I wouldn't leave here if I was you. Well, you're not me, so get out of my way. Max, Max, what's the matter? Oh, Fräulein, he's gonna leave you. No, Joe, no. I've got to, Norma. Joe, you can't do this. Max, stop him. Look at me, Joe. Look at me. I can't face life without you. You're everything to me. My life, my love. If you go, I'll kill myself. Do you hear me? I'll kill myself. It was after she read this big dramatic speech that I wish Mary were back on the show. <laughs> screaming. Joe, Joe, you can't leave me. I'm going, Norma. Goodbye. You can't go, Joe. Nobody leaves a star. Ooh. Yes, she killed me. And I fell dead in her swimming pool. The only consolation is that they gave me a nice funeral. And I had wonderful pallbearers. There was Brannigan, Flanagan, <laughs> Milligan, Gilligan, Duffy McGuffey, Malarkey Mahone. Rafferty Lafferty, Connolly Donnelly, Dooley Shapiro. <laughs> yes, that is my story. I lived and died on Sunset Boulevard. Jack, we'll be back in just a moment. And now let's review this morning's Easter parade. My Easter bonnet is the best, so men will be beguiled. The way they are by lucky strikes the smoke most rich and mild. That's why Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. This happy day I win real plays when strolling down the street. Cause I give perfect Lucky Strikes to everyone I meet. You'll agree, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Be happy, go lucky, be happy, go lucky, strike, be happy, go 
Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette, and here's why. Fine tobacco, and only fine tobacco always gives you perfect mildness and rich, true tobacco taste. And every smoker knows, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Yes, with every Lucky you light, you always get that happy blending of real mildness and rich, true taste. Now, if you're not happy with your present brand, and a 38-city survey shows that millions are not, switch to Lucky Strike. You'll agree, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. So be happy. Go Lucky. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. Be happy. Go Lucky. Go Lucky Strike today. Remember, Lucky's taste better than any other cigarette. Ladies and gentlemen, immediately following next Sunday's radio program, I'll do my third television show. As my guest stars, I'll have Claudette Colbert, Robert Montgomery, and Basil Rathbone. This will be seen in the eastern area next Sunday, and two weeks later will be seen on the west coast by Kinescope. Happy Easter, everybody. Be sure to hear Dennis Day and the Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned the latest Mandy Show, which follows immediately. The Jack Benny Show is heard by our armed forces overseas for the television of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Word Detective was essentially a commercial for Underwood typewriters. It was a little three-minute segment exploring the history of a particular word brought to you by, who else, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, in the form of Basil Rathbone. These are fun. I'm just going to give you three of them. From November 2nd, 1959, Tangerine. From November 5th, 1959, Melba Toast. And from November 6th, 1959, Stoic. 2,000 years ago, in the crowded marketplace of an ancient North African city, the soldiers of Caesar Augustus sampled an exotic new delicacy from the East. This was the start of a chain of events which led to a treat on our tables and a word in our dictionaries. You'll hear more of that word on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, for more than 60 years a leader in the field of typewriters and business machines. During the years when the sprawling Roman Empire fanned out to include most of North Africa, the Emperor Caesar Augustus signed an imperial edict which elevated a bustling Mediterranean seaport called Tanja to the status of a free city. We know this ancient Moorish metropolis as Tangier. In Caesar's time, it was a rich and cultured metropolis, an important stop on Arab trade routes from the Far East. Uh, the gate of the city which led to the, the produce-packed stalls of the marketplace gave local citizens access to a selection of the most exotic wares in the world. Spices from Ceylon, steel from Damascus, and at some point during Tanja's long history, nobody quite knows when, the squatting marketplace moors added to their display a strange but delicious new fruit, delivered to the West African port by Arab caravans from the Malay archipelago half a world away. Within a short time after the fruit from the east was first put on sale in the marketplace, it was not only being served on West African tables, but also being cultivated in thick West African groves. When Caesar's foreign-based GIs visited the Tanja marketplace, this same cycle started all over again. They came, they saw, they tasted, and conquered by the experience, started their own flourishing fruit groves back home in Italy. Tucked into the toe of a Christmas stocking or adding color to the fruit centerpiece of a Thanksgiving table, we're apt to think of the fruit now as being all American. But when we add it to our shopping lists, we still refer to it as if we were ordering not from a neighborhood a grocery store, but from the honey-scented stalls of a crowded North African marketplace. Maybe you know now the word which all this is leading up to. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The word is tangerine, meaning literally a native of Tangier. This red-tinged member of the orange family, distinguished by its easily detached rind, actually originated somewhere in tropical Asia. We know it as a tangerine because 2,000 years ago, a group of African-based Roman soldiers went shopping in a Moorish market for souvenirs for the folks back home. On tomorrow's edition of Word Detective, we're off to the races! in search of not just one word history, but a whole bundle of them. Now, don't go away. I'll be back in a moment. In the era when the girl who was um, up to the minute was expected to display an hourglass figure 
A buxom soprano christened Helen Porter Mitchell was the toast of New York and every capital in Europe. Today, in a way, she still is. You will see what I mean in the course of this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the makers of Underwood Typewriters. In 1893, just one year before the debut of the very first Underwood Typewriter, music-loving New Yorkers thronged to the Metropolitan Opera House for the American debut of the soprano who was already the darling of Europe. She came, she sang, she conquered. However, the particular incident which affects our dictionaries had to do not with the high C, but with low calories. As many soprano before and since, this noteworthy lady worried considerably about her weight. For many months during her tenure as prima donna of London's Covent Garden, she engaged the services of a masseuse who came to our house in London every morning. But alas, it wasn't enough. She had to go on a strict diet, too. And herein lies her entrance into our dictionaries today. After one Covent Garden triumph, she went off to celebrate with a party of friends in the dining room of the Hotel Savoy. Exercising a great self-control, she shook her head at Pheasant under glass and asked the waiter instead for a plain order of unbuttered toast. Somehow or other, the toast order was shunted off to an inexperienced assistant. When the prima donna received her snack, it was dry, thin, and hard. But instead of reacting to this with a temper tantrum, the soprano not only quietly ate the toast, but asked for another order of it, exactly the same. And now I suspect you know how this lady of the opera fits into our dictionaries, and in some case, our diets. I'll type the expression out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with a golden touch. It was Melba Toast. After the turn of the century, prima donna Nellie Melba. The singer was born Helen Porter Mitchell in Australia back in the 60s, but when she made her opera debut in Brussels in 1887, she adopted the stage name Melba after the city of Melbourne in Australia. As any lover of rich desserts knows, Madame Nelly was responsible for the naming not only of the diet dish of Milba toast, but also a high-calorie concoction of vanilla ice cream, peaches, and claret sauce originated by the great French chef Escoffier, in short, Peach Milba. All of which means that Madame Milba was the only opera singer in history to be the toast of the town and also its dessert. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. You may live among completely modern furnishings in a 1959 model split-level house in the newest housing development in town. But your vocabulary, nonetheless, contains a touch of ancient Greek design. We'll be exploring this relationship between the creation of an Athenian architect over 2,000 years ago and our present-day speech on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, leaders in the field of typewriters and business machines for more than 60 years. 2,300 years ago, among the favorite sightseeing spots of the thriving Greek city of Athens was the bustling local marketplace. One of the favorite sites there? An open colonnade at the north side of the market decorated with colorful panoramic scenes of great moments in Greek history. The paintings were big, impressive, and created by a famous Greek artist named Polygnotus. But the tourists, in truth, weren't nearly as interested in the pictures as in the Athenian citizens who strolled on a covered porch in front of them. Just as Hollywood sightseers flock to a restaurant where they have a chance of seeing Marilyn Monroe in person, so did these visitors hang about the porch on the north side of the Athens marketplace. Since Athens was at its peak quite a few years before the invention of motion pictures, the sightseers came not to ogle at movie stars, but at another sort of celebrity, philosophers. The professional thinking men in these filterless days of ancient Greece did most of their thinking in public places, in stores or temples or public bars or perhaps on street corners. Beginning in about 300 B.C., a goodly number of them made their headquarters every day on the open public porch where Polygnotus' illustrious battle paintings were displayed. They talked, they argued, and interested citizens were welcome to listen all they liked. In time, the influence of these thinkers spread far beyond Greece. But no matter where they lived, the followers of this philosophical school referred to themselves as if they had developed their ideas in the shelter 
of an Athenian marketplace colonnade to people who seem to follow these philosophical ideas today, we give the same name. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The word is stoic, currently used to describe someone who seems not to be affected by passion or feeling, someone who's indifferent to either pleasure or pain. We get the word stoic from the school of ancient thinkers who established indifference to pleasure and pain as a philosophical goal. The ancient thinkers got their name because they hung out inside a painted porch in the Athens marketplace, such a porch in Greek being a stoa. On tap for next edition of Word Detective is the story of a murder case which greatly shocked the citizens of the 12th century and gave us a word. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. That's your old-time radio fix for this week. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Be sure to subscribe to The Chronic Rift on iTunes or visit us frequently at chronicrift.com. What a voice. What a voice. Simply means ink. I think you do. I think you do. Good night, folks. Signing off.